just got back from a week at Y Angler, and I'm telling you, Garmin is the way to go. Now, we've got the Garmin Pro himself, Matthew Lankford, again on tonight. So let's talk about all things fish finders and how to catch these big Mary Cod. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's go live. Go quick. Ah, oh, g'day everyone. G'day Ricky, Clissa, Jordan, Jeremy, David. How are we all? The bald-headed babies. Let's go. Um, listen, got heaps covered tonight. I have my uh, close friend and uh, regular guest, Matthew Langford, on. We're going to talk about all things uh, Garmin. I was blown away. He was at the AYC on the weekend and uh, I believe it was the top six come in. I am sold on these pole dancing gurus and how they're catching their cod so i thought as soon as i got back i'd get maddie on for a chat and uh let's uh let's bring him in here in a minute we've got uh postcodes don't forget to whack your postcodes in as well uh to win a prize we have a prize for postcodes we have some more prizes other to give away as well um I'd like to, from the weekend, I'd like to thank Bruce from AYC for all of his help to actually get me there. I left before the lockdown, had some problems with my anglers, reflections getting in the gate, but they let me in finally uh, through Bruce's help and everyone else's help. So uh, thanks to everyone at the AYC. I'd also like to thank all the sponsors, Mako, Bassman, Wilson, Jackal, Daiwa, Garmin, Venom, Zeric, Outback Angler, McKnight Signs, and Loomsy's Fish and Fix. For all of your help, get a who else we got? Shane, Jordan, Adrian, Mark, James, they're all popping on now. So uh, don't forget, Harry's inside. He will pick the postcode winner very soon. Um, the Pay It Forward campaign, I've got to talk about that really quickly. As I'm not going to get to um, Queensland anymore, we're going to try and organise to get some of the Pay It Forward uh, gifts bought down and maybe halfway and I can go and pick them up. We'll see what happens with COVID lockdowns and that sort of thing. Don't forget also I have uh, next week I'll be dropping the shirts, uh, Guernseys and everything else for sale. So uh, they will go up for sale next week. You'll have two weeks to put in your order and it'll be posted directly out to you. Oh, what else? That's it. Let's bring him in. G'day, Langers. How you going, mate? Good. How you going? Yeah, good, good. Looking forward to wiving home, mate. I am. Yeah, I am. Been a bit of a break away from tournament fishing for a while, so I'm real keen to get back and get back to the competitive side of it. Yeah, you've uh, you've uh, put in a fair bit of time at uh, Wyvern and Ho through your charters anyway. So uh, are you gonna gonna let some secrets out tonight? Now that I'm not coming, we might be able to have to uh, uh, chew the fat hard tonight and. Uh, <laughs> Push those, uh, push those questions and maybe give some hints away. G'day, Matty. G'day, Salty. What do you reckon? We'll get some, get some hints and tips out? Oh, yeah, I'm happy to help. Happy to help? <laughs> I won't give everything away, though. No, way. that's it. That's it. Hey, um, this time last year, I believe, if everyone goes back to their diaries, uh, 40 and that went up there and Fish Wyvernhoe just before they went to the Somerset round and I reckon brained them. So uh, anything could happen. Uh, what's it fishing like? Is it fishing okay? Um, it's, been, it's been consistently inconsistent. So, yep. um, there's been no real consistency over uh, over the last sort of six weeks, I suppose. But um, <clears throat> there's moments of brilliance there where you can, you know, you can catch oh, for your four fish, you can catch twelve kilos and plus plus anything else, you know. But yeah, there's 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 a lot of small fish and there's a lot of catfish, 
Um, and there's a pro- there's a ridiculous amount of yellow belly in there too. So yeah, they um, should be in that spawning cycle about now. So um, yeah. you know, there'll be uh, beat up old females and and yellows following everything up. I mean, yeah. yeah, between them and the catfish trying to find a bass might be a little bit too hard. Yeah, no, pe- people will catch them. I guarantee people will catch them if we can get a bit of consistent weather um, happening over the next week or so, which it looks like might happen um yeah it should it should turn it on for us hopefully but um i'm expecting a tough comp like you've got to expect that every comp but um there's going to be some big fish caught yeah look there are some donkeys in there so we uh we just hope that um when the when the scales go live you're at the at the point end of the stick i know that uh you don't really worry about um that sort of thing internally, you just go out there and just try and catch a fish and um, mm-hmm. put the red jacket on like Tiger Woods on Sunday and just come home like you did at uh, St. Clair, mate. Yeah, that's always – it's like you said, it's, it's always the aim just to go out and make sure you catch your bag. Um, you know, as long as you – it doesn't matter how big they are, as long as you bring a bag in and try and be respectable. But it doesn't happen all the time, but um, hopefully it'll happen this week, yeah. Yeah, no, look, and, and you've always been Mr. Consistent. I mean, the, the, you know, it, it's the way that you fish. I think the only only comp where you actually swung for the fence might have been a grand final at Boondooma and, um, and at Kostya. <laughs> Um, you've <laughs> always, always played, uh, played it safe. You're one of the, one of the safe anglers. And as you can see with your results over the years, it's, I don't think there's many that you've uh, probably two tournaments in the last five years that I know of that you may have pulled out of the top ten. So, um, Mr. Consistent. So, we've got our first question here. Um, Nick Brown's put it in. Uh, Maddie, would you rather what's the live scope or the Broncos at the moment? Uh, uh, live scope hands down with that one. Hey, they had a win on the weekend. Um, you, you know, you can't always win. Yeah, yeah. It was good. It was good to watch them. It was good to watch them play and win, but yeah, it's it, they're hard to watch. I tell you, <laughs> but much, <laughs> I'd much prefer uh, watching the live scope than um, than the Broncos of late. But anyway, that that's how that's how it goes, you know. Like that, that's how um, that's how it is. But yeah, I'd, I'd much prefer the live scope over anything, really. Yeah, that's it. And and as I said, uh, I, you know, and, and not many people know behind the scenes how much shit. I've hung on you for being the Garmin guru and uh, um, bagging out, you know, not bagging out the product because, you know, the product's always been good. We've had our fun times on it on the front of your boat, but um, yeah. just to hang it on you for, for a long period of time. And now I have decided that uh, I'm going to bite the bullet. If I'm going to fish these COD comps down here, uh, it's the way to go. Six of the top six uh, teams on the weekend were all running Garmin. Um it, it just, it's hunting. It's not fishing. So um, mm-hmm. purely and simply, I, I, I was given the analogy by a guy up there on the weekend that if you're sitting on top of the hill and you've got a goat down on the bottom of the hill, you put him in his sights and you shoot him. You don't aim 30 metres to the left to try and um, hit him. And mm-hmm. that's what that's what using the live scope is. You're actually putting that lure in front of the fish's face and... Um, Regularly, the, I was watching the boys on the weekend, and some of them were were maybe three casts in a half an hour period. They were just scanning and scanning and scanning, finding one. I've got a YouTube video which I'll drop tomorrow uh, of my fishless uh, weekend at Wangler, but I've got a heap of footage there where I've got them on the side scan. I've got the bait, and I strongly believe. If I was using live scope, I may have landed two or three of those fish rather than just scatter casting to try and find those fish. So, um, yeah. listen, I've got this video here. I did play it uh, on my uh, intro this afternoon, but I'm going to bring this uh, video up if I can work my computer properly and uh, show everyone that's on this before we get into your questions. Um, let's have a look at. Um, Matty here, I said that I was hoping he was wearing shorts because I reckon you could have seen his old fella in this one. So you watch this. So you can see his legs, you can see his arms, you can see everything. There's a little bit of glare from, I think it's Nettie's hat there. But um, that's uh, that's pretty impressive technology that right there, Matty. I've got to get that to go. There we go. 
So, um, yeah, got the wrong button here. <laughs> I'm running the studio really well. <laughs> I've been away fishing. So, uh, yeah, that's um, that's very impressive on what you're actually um, able to do with that Garmin stuff. Tell us a bit about it. What where for the for the guys at the on the bass scene? Um, do you do you use it a lot for the bass? Um, for the live scope you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. So with um with the bass, I think um the more that I use it, the more I'm learning about it, the more I'm 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 trialing and testing things. But um, definitely for the bass, the, the difficult thing with live scope on our smaller species is at times you can distinguish what is what, but there's a lot of times where you'll be, you know, fishing for fish and you're not sure if they're, um, if they're yellow belly or bass, um, especially when they're really, really spread out. Um, there are heaps of times where, you know, you're on a big school of bass because there's thousands of them, you know, like bass tend to school, school up um, heavily in, in some dams and at some certain times of the year, but, when they're when they when they're spread out on a on a big flat or or something like that, it can be difficult to distinguish what the fish are. But the the perfect thing is you can see the fish, um, and in that video that you saw there, um, you can see that the term live scope is a, a live image. You're seeing an image that is moving, that is interactive. You're seeing everything that's happening as it happens under the water. So there's no lag. There's no second guessing of what it is. It's it's really easy to see that, you know, you can see a fish swimming. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> you, you comment about the the cod fishing is, um, you know, I I did a, a trip down to Copeton uh, a week and a half ago, and there is no second guessing when you have a cod on the screen. You can you can see a, a yellow belly, and you'll you'll say radio. There's a fish. But then you see a cod, cod, you know, if it's a smaller cod that's the size of a yellow belly, yeah, it's hard to distinguish. But, you know, you you, you see a meter cod on that live scope, you know instantly what it is and, yeah. you know, exactly where it is. Um, uh, you're talking about the pole dancers. So in reference to that, basically the, the, a lot of the cod guys have got um, their transducer mounted on a pole. I've got mine mounted on my electric, so I, I can spin my electric to face the particular way that I want to be fishing. But the guys for the cod, you know, use it on a pole. So they, they can point it in the direction that they see the fish. You can see exactly which way he's moving, whether he's swimming towards you, away from you, left or right. Because if he's moving to the right and you turn the pole left and he's not there, then, you know, you follow it to the right. That's the way he's going. So there's no guessing. <coughs> Uh, on the screen, you can see how many feet that you are away from them. And it's, you know, once you get all your bearings right and you know, then you, like you said about those boys, um, we did something similar at Cope and we'd, we'd find a fish. And normally, you know, we didn't catch a lot of fish because, the, you know, the fishing was a little bit tough at the time. But you can see exactly where they are, where you need to cast. And that's why those guys do so well using live scope. And I think that there are some really relevant points. It, it builds your confidence for one because you know if the fish is reacting to start with. You yes. can watch it follow. You know you're doing something right or wrong on your retrieve. You can see the fish reacting to some baits and not reacting to other baits and what you're throwing. So I think in a tournament situation for cod, when you're limited for amount of time and, you know, a thousand casts, the fish of a thousand casts, we all say it, you're limiting that time. I think the skeezy boy said on the on the weekend they were talking to Dave Welfare, and I think they said one in ten. Yeah. So for every ten fish they're seeing and throwing to, they they get a reaction out of one. Yeah. So for for us that are that are scatter casting and working a bank all the way up, we're we're you know out of the game in that sense because they have to do it, but they they're doing it on their time frame when. You know, we've just got to we've got to lay more cars. So, 
Um, yeah. We've got another, another vid here that I want to show you before I start getting into the questions. We've got a heap of questions coming in. Um, the Two Mortons Fishing on Facebook. If you haven't seen this video, um, I will show you this video really quickly. Jump on their Facebook page and, and uh, give them a like and a, and a share. This video, you can actually see the lure drop, and I'll, hopefully my mouse will uh, be able to direct you down. But in the middle of the screen, you'll see the lure drop down. The fish will come over and eat the lure. You see the fish starting to fight, and then another couple of fish come in to check out what all the uh, kerfuffle is. So this is a great video. I'll, um, I'll just bring this up on the screen, and let's do this one here. So you watch the, the lure go down in the water about uh, oh, about the 12 feet mark and it'll go down towards the bottom here um, and you'll watch the fish come over and grab it. So you can see the fish just swimming around there on the bottom at 12 feet. Now he's just taking that lure. They've, they've set the hook. You can see the fish fighting. They're trying to pull it off the bottom. You can see another fish over here at 16 feet coming in to check it out. And then another one swims in above it from about 12 feet into the... And you can see the fish squirreling around there. Um, this is amazing footage. So don't forget to jump on the Two Mortons fishing page and have a look at this. Um, but that's insane, Maddie. Like, you know, you're just worlds in front of uh, everyone else, aren't you? I, I missed that. Sorry, mate. You're right. So I just said you're, you're worlds in front of everyone else with um, with that sort of live sight. You can see that. Yeah, yeah. That um, that footage is awesome because, the, like you said, you can see the lure falling, the cod sitting on the bottom, um, and then a second cod comes in. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't even know that. You wouldn't know using anything else. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it's it's just it's a game changer. Like. You know, three or four years ago, before Panoptics and before LiveScope, we, we always sat there and we'd say, oh, cod are territorial, one cod per tree. Um, this, not only guys like Rod McKenzie have been saying for years that he's pulling multiple big cod off one snag, but yeah. you sort of, you know, oh, that's just Rod, he's a guru, he'll catch them anywhere. Mm -hmm. But now you're actually physically seeing it, you cannot deny that there is multiple big fish in an area. Mm. Yeah, so you can... I'll give you a scenario. So the way the way that I uh, um, this is this is a bit out of, out of um, with the different species, but the way that I use live scope um, multiple times to find uh, where the fish are. For example, Sinclair this year was a typical example of of doing it right and, and winning. Um, I had I had a, a stretch of trees, um, and there was probably. 500, no, oh, there wouldn't have been 500. There would have been 200 trees. And over the, the over the course of my, my pre-fish and on Saturday, I got to go along to each one of those trees and I pointed the live scope under each individual tree. And what I, what I could do is I could see the particular trees that <clears throat> held the fish. So I'd mark them and I'd do 10 other trees that would have very small amounts of fish or none at all so i could just totally discount those trees and i could go along and i i basically went from having um 200 trees to fish down to having 30 productive trees to fish so i knew exactly where the big schools of fish were or the schools that held good numbers of fish so i just i really really minimized my um productive fishing time into you know, really specific productive fishing time to make sure that I was banging the right trees and putting my casts into the trees that were that yeah. held the decent fish. And you know uh, that that um, you know the Sunday I went out with Mal, we hit those trees straight up and they produced for us. And then um, after that, you know, we we after we'd done the trees, I was even lucky enough to get upgrades after that as well. But um, with the cod fishing, like I said before. If you're fishing a dam like Copeton or most most cod dams, not all of them, but most cod dams will have some sort of structure, and you can go to each one of those trees if you can see them out of the water. That's fantastic. You can go and look under those. But even if you do have live scope, you can have your pole down or your trolling motor down, and you can just be scanning and looking for submerged trees because Copeton prime example 
week and a half ago, I found a, a patch of trees on one particular point that had trees right up on the edge, but then those trees, there was a line of trees that basically followed the ridge right down into the deep water. And I found that the fish that I was targeting up shallow, there was hardly any fish up there. But as soon as I sunk out into 50 feet, there was one particular tree had eight cod sitting on it. Yeah. And I, I cast my lure out, or, or the guy that we were fishing with, he cast his lure out. We watched it sink. We watched one of the cod. All seven of them were all in the same area. <clears throat> but one cod in particular, he showed interest, put his head up, came out of the snag and ate the lure, but unfortunately we dropped him. But <clears throat> we watched every single thing on, li on live scope. I think the fact that the guy, he could see the cod coming for the lure, he almost panicked, you know, like yeah. he got the bite, pulled. You could see the lure even shoot out of the cod's mouth. And then as soon as that happened, the cod, um, he, he was facing up with seat, the lure. Then all he did was he just put his head down and mooched on down to the bottom and sulked. So yep. that was our one opportunity of, of catching a fish on live scope. But um, yeah, it was pretty cool to watch. And I think, uh, as you said, the, the thing is I'm not bagging out other products. Yep. Uh, each has their own thing over. But with the, with the live scope, mm. you're seeing it live and you're cutting down your fishing time, especially yep. the tournament fishermen. You know, as you said at Sinclair, you weren't wasting your time. See, I would have had to fish all 25 of those trees where you'd pick your three out that, that were really holding the fish. So that's yeah. a good tip for anyone that is buying a Garmin or look at, looking into a Garmin. We yeah. have our first winner tonight. Harry has picked the postcode winner out from inside. So thanks for that, Harry. We've got uh, – it is 3555, and the winner is uh, Brian Yana. So, uh, Brian, if you can uh, send me a message on my Facebook page, I'll bring up your prize here. It is a couple of uh, Ricky Goward's uh, – Genetic lures, so if you can see that there, and somebody did comment, Simon Jackson, yeah, no beer tonight, mate. I'm on the coffee, so um, <laughs> that's your um, that's your prize there, Brian. So a couple of hard bodies there. I know you're a cod fisho, so um, you'll love those ones. So um, send us your message, and I will um, get them off to you. So let's go into some questions, Maddie. Um, let's start off at the top. So. Matt, do you do you use the live scope on the front sounder all of the time, or do you mount the banjuicer on a pole? I think you've sort of answered that one. So you have it uh, mounted on your electric, don't you? Yeah. So I've got um, I've got four units on my boat. So I've got two at the console and two at the front. So my 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 front has I have I've got two twelves. My right hand is just a standalone live scope, hundred percent of the time. So my my transducer, my live scope transducer, is actually mounted on my um, <clears throat> on my um, trolling motor. So I, I see the benefits in both, but I like to be scanning. So even if I'm on unproductive water, I'm on my foot pedal or on the hand remote, just scanning the water, just trying to find fish. Um, <clears throat> so, and that benefits you too when you're chartering because you're at the back of the boat. Yep. using the hand controller and your customers are up the front, you can't mm -hmm. stand up there in their way with a pole either. So, yeah, yep. your benefits of both worlds there for you. Yeah, that's right. And, and even, like you just said, like even if I'm guiding and I'm not up the front, I'll have that front one going so the guy's fishing, they can see what's happening. But, you know, I've, I've got the, the sounders linked so that when I'm sitting at the console, I can watch my live scope screen and... Um, you know, I can even talk them through. I can say, there's your lure sinking, radio, start warning now. And <clears throat> they'll see, you know, if we got bass suspended in 20 feet, for example, they can see where the lure is. They can get their counts right. They can do everything uh, and see that lure traveling through the water. And they can see the bite a lot of the time as well, yep. um, which is which is extra special. It's really, It's really interactive. Yeah, cool. Uh, Brody just uh, said here, Matty, super keen to meet up with you and the boys on Thursday. Um, Brody's first year of uh, ABT this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another first year of Bo Everly, another um, – he's on every week watching the show. Um, he wants to know if you could tell him um, one lure you need in his tackle bag, uh, what would it be? I'm going to ask you first, Captain. What do you reckon? What Spoon. Would you <laughs> Bow. I reckon, Bo, if you're fishing in Queensland, the one thing that works mm, 
10 months of the year, I suppose, really productively is a spoon. Yeah. Um, you know, 20 gram Halco Twisty, uh, an 18 gram Norris Wasabi spoon, whatever. It's, if, it's, if it's silver and it's flashy, the bass in uh, Queensland will eat it. Yeah. Um, yeah, hands down. So that's one, definitely one lure. My, my spoon box, I've got probably 300 spoons, so they're, they're pretty popular on my boat. And uh, for you, for the guys that haven't jumped onto Langers' Facebook page, um, more to the point, jump on his YouTube. What's your YouTube again, Matthew Lankford? Uh, just Matthew uh, Lankford Fishing, isn't it? I think it's – I think uh, – I can't even remember what my YouTube channel is called. Yeah, I so um, Matty yeah. puts up um, tips and hints – on his YouTube channel, and uh, we'll we'll get it put in the description for you um, later on. So if you're after some really cool tips, jump onto his you know, onto his YouTube channel and have a look. Especially with the spoons. Now, Langers and I did fish together, and I uh, quite often will pull one spoon out, and there'll be forty five spoons connected to it. He had a, a really good tip about spoons and taking his sting hooks off. So jump on his YouTube channel. Lots of lots of hints and tips on that one. Uh Brody must be turning twenty. You're gonna have to give him twenty birthday punches. G'day Rebecca. Happy birthday, Brody. Uh Tracy Ryan says hi. Oh, g'day Ryan. Hey buddy. Uh Bruce Calissa, happy birthday, Brody. Yeah, uh, cool. All right. Um Another long one there. I'm not going to go into. I'm not going to bring that one up on the screen. It'll fill the whole screen. But um, Brady was saying that he was in talking to Chris from Fishing Bits, another big supporter of of you, um, with the rumor of Garmin going the next step in the 360 live scope possibly happening soon. Is that um, something you've heard? The possibilities are endless with with sounder technology. You just you just don't know. Like like you're saying before, each brand has got a really good point to their to their technology, you know. So um, I know multiple guys that have got three brands of sounders on their boat and they've utilised little bits or the best bits of each brand to put on their boat. Um, so it's a competitive market. So someone's going to come out with something that's just mind-boggling. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that comes out of 360 Live. You know, who knows? That's uh, it's, yeah. it's possible. The rumours are around that um, um, Hummingbird Mega 360 um, is uh, going to be the next big thing. It's all pretty hush-hush, but it is coming out of the States very soon. Look, find a technology. <laughs> it's as long as your, your bank account is, you know, as long as you've got the money in your bank account and keep replacing. I will be buying a Garmin. There is no if, buts, or what's about that. I'm going to have to save up my money and buy one. I'm not getting my rid of my Lowrance, my Whaler, and um, the mapping on my Whaler. I paid for the extra um, extra satellite mapping as well, so I know where every laydown is in my Whaler. I'm not getting rid of my Lowrance. I'm just adding Garmin to it. And if, um, if Hummingbird come in with their 360, I'll probably end up with a 360 on the front of my boat. I will do anything to improve my fishing um, in, in the tournament sense. If I was still social fishing, probably wouldn't make a difference. So Nick, Brown, <laughs> Nick Brown's got a question here. With two sounders set up, would you spend more on the console unit or would you rather a better quality screen up the front running the live scope? Um, <clears throat> I think you put your finger on it before, Captain. I think it's all about affordability. So... Whatever you can afford, um, get it. So my recommendation would be if you're gonna run um, <clears throat> if you're gonna run a, a decent sounder, try and have try and have your your sounders linked and have one of them a good one. So generally the one at the console because I, I sit at my console a lot. So when I'm driving around, um, <clears throat> whether I'm just sounding, side imaging, um, or using the live scope, I'm sitting at the console looking at my screen. Um, <clears throat> my pre-fish days have, have changed now from fishing to, to sounding more than anything. So um, I, I would spend money on the console, but even the one up the front, you know, the, the, the different sounders that are out there, you know, try and go for something that's got a fast processing unit and 
high definition um, capability. That's what now, I'm Yeah, about. I'm not talking out of school here. Like you've been with Garmin now for a couple of years, uh, probably going closer to three, but you yeah. were still winning comps before you had Garmin. And I know for a fact that you had, I mean, we don't need to mention brands, but you had two brand, you had two sounders on your boat and you had your good one at the console and you used to flip it around and um, use it. You didn't even turn your front sounder on most of the time because that's all you could afford at that point in time was the, the good sounder. So you shared it and you yeah. just turned around and looked at it, didn't you? So yeah. it's what you can afford. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. No, we, yeah, exactly exactly like you're saying. They're, they're, even the early days, me and my nephew Kyle, we fished, I think, one or two tournaments with no sounder whatsoever, like nothing, yep. because we couldn't we couldn't afford it. That's that's just what it was the times, you know. Like I was straight out of straight out of uni, and you know had a few tough times and whatever else as well. But I just couldn't afford it. But um, you know, you slowly upgrade into things you can afford, and um, you know, even I'd, I'd even go as far as saying, you know, save save your money, work hard, save your money because um, it's worth it. Because you, you'll definitely get more out of your fishing. Um, and, and learn a lot about it, you know, do research, watch a lot of videos, just make sure you're watching videos that are from a credible source um, and even talk to people that know their units or, or even retailers that they they need to know what it's all about because they're selling the units. So know what you're getting yourself into and what you're paying for. Yeah, and go like some of those um, retailers too. They they will stock multiple different styles of unit. They don't just stock the one style of unit, and they will, they're not trying to sell you one unit over the other. They'll mm -hmm. give you the best points of both. So yeah, um, g'day Patrick Bailey, how you going, mate? Uh, Ricky Goward. Um, Ricky's got a question here. Um, hey guys, would like to know the depth range of live scope. What's you know, where's where's the deepest water you've been running it in? Um, that's I haven't I haven't tested it to its maximum sort of capability because a lot of my fishing is based around water depth of, you know, a maximum of oh, probably 60, 60 to seventy feet, um, and it it works fine. I've caught fish at Boondoomba and Somerset in sixty feet of water, and and the you, you'll still see the fish quite easily. So. Um, as far as offshore goes, I don't know because I, I don't take my units offshore and I, and I haven't seen too much in super deep water. But as far as live scope goes, um, yeah, I've, I've caught fish in 60, 70 feet um, and, and being able to see exactly where, you, where your lure is, it'll, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, that's, that's pretty deep for a, for a freshwater lake, 60 feet. Commonly they're at 20 and they, that, that's fine. You know, you can see everything really well. Yeah, and you don't need to be um, scanning the bottom in 100 feet of water if the fish are sitting at 20 either. So I know yeah. I know Ricky's uh, sent me a couple of messages over the last couple of weeks. He's a big supporter of the show, yeah. and um, he was tossing up whether to go Garmin or 360 or the Rance, and he was, he's buying a new boat, and he wanted to know what setups and whatnot. Yeah. I sort of said to him, I said, look, if you're going to fish a couple of comps, go out with all these boys, check out all their, their different technology and, you know, mm. see what it's up. And that's the good thing about um, about the tournaments when you're co-boating is to see what everyone else is using. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Down Hannaford said, Hell code Twisty with Stinger attached all the way. Well, I agree with that. They didn't call me the Boondoom and Spoon of an Oven. <laughs> is that Dion Hanford you said? Yeah, yeah. Spot on. All right, David, uh, David Wally. Uh, hey, Matty, what's the effect depth and distance from the boat for your live scope? So it's a very similar question to the to the last one, I think. He, he, what's your what's your distance for casting? I personally, you know, they they can you, live scope can go out to I think it's three hundred feet or something. So um, it's, it's probably not even that far, but it's it goes out a long, long way. So um, <clears throat> generally, I find that my I'm more effective in my casting and accuracy between sixty and eighty feet. So that's that's a that's a you know eighty feet's a fair cast. It's not a huge cast, but it's a a fair cast, and that's 
that's what I want to be looking at purely because I, I've worked out my distances. I know what 10 feet is to 20 to, to 30 is, and 60 feet is just a comfortable cast. So I'm generally, I've generally, I've got my unit set to between 60 and 80 feet just so I can scan around. Now, the further out you get with your, um, with your live scope, you're starting to, you're starting to really compress your image into, you know, if you've got 12 inches of screen, you're, you're compressing, you know, 200 or, or 200 feet into a 12 inch screen and everything gets really, really tight. So I'm, I'm expanding everything and I'm zooming into that 60 to 80 feet. And that really gives me a good sense of number one, the, the depth that they're sitting. It gives me a good idea of the fish's size as well. And yep. even the density at times, you know, we, we get fish in that 20 uh, foot thermocline and we can see the density of the fish as well. So, yes, yeah, so that 60 to 80 feet is generally what I do for bass. I know there's going to be a heap of different answers to this for to different people that use the system. But I just find that if it's too zoomed in um, on, you know, the maximum capability you can do, it's all right in the fact that if you're trying to find big uh, concentrations of fish, you can do that. You can find those big solid clumps, go up to it, and then zoom it out. But that's that's what I do with, with yep. the distance, yeah. I was watching those COD guys on the weekend. Like, a lot of that, they were flipping. They were flipping yeah. gantles. There was no need for an eight-foot COD um, swim bait rod because yep. they were literally only casting it 20 feet in front of them um, yep. both ways. So, you know, it was yep. amazing to see. And that's, that's cool. Like, what you just brought up, too, is a really good example. So they'll... Um, you know, they'll zoom out to that 60 to 80 feet or 100 feet or whatever and try and find that submerged tree. They'll find the submerged tree, go over to it. Then they'll zoom right into, you know, 10 to, sorry, not 10 feet, but 20 feet um, just out in front of them. And then they can really, really study the tree. They can see everything that's in the tree, the yellows, the cod, the bait, everything. And like you said, that, you know, that, uh, instance that we were at Copeton, we were only flipping just to try and get that lure in front of the fish. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, that's what you want to do. If you can, if you can come across, you know, you zoom your screen right in to to look at just that area in front of your boat. Um, you can see the size of the fish better. You know, the the definition comes in, and you can you can try and land that lure on that fish's head. Yep, just uh, look, we're trying to go through the questions in order so I don't miss any. And this is not a Garmin one, but this is a fishing one. Mm -hmm. uh, Aiden Lodo has uh, asked about drop shotting. Any tips on drop shotting? Um, drop shotting. I think with drop shotting, we don't, we don't do it a lot over here, but it is an effective technique. So... Um, tips for drop shotting, I, I would recommend don't go a really heavy weight as your as your um, as your uh, weight. So I've, I've found a quarter ounce, one eighth or one six is really effective. Um, you, you get a really heavy weight on there, and it, it can really plug it on the bottom. And it, you know when you wiggle that weight, it's um, you don't get as much movement out of that lure. Um, now, when we're talking drop shot, basically what, what he's talking about is a is a, a weight on the bottom. It's almost like a pattern oster, I guess. Yeah. Um, you've got about a foot of line, and then you've got a little, uh, a very light gauge hook, an upside down weighted hook even. Um, but you're fishing small lures that are basically just suspended off the bottom, about that foot to two foot. So um, I found effective lures... For, for Australian bass in particular, that's what I fish for, are small worms. Our bass, um, if they're hungry, they'll eat a big worm. But I, I've, I've, you know, tried two-inch worms up to four-inch, but two inches is generally the best. Um, and shad-type lures, so um, uh, jerk shad style, you know, small jerk shad style lures, normally two to three inches in length that, that – they don't have to have a tail, but they just have to have that little. Basically, they're looking like this in the water. They've got that little waving motion to them. Yep. Um, and the way you're working that lure, a lot of the time you're not casting it; you're dropping it down vertically. That's the way I like to fish it. And basically, you're just with your rod tip. You're not. You're not really aggressive with it. Basically, all you're doing is tapping the rod tip 
just so that little that little tail is just making that little bit of movement to get those fish interested. But um, I don't know where where Aiden's from, but drop shotting is an underused uh, technique for redfin. Um, yeah. Yep. Because they're such an aggressive fish, um, but I haven't really done it a lot for the bass. So great question, Aiden. I'm going to give you the first prize of the night, mate. So um, if you can get my details um, or your details to me on my Facebook page, I will post you out uh, for lure wallets. So these, awesome. these lure wallets here, I'll bring them up on the on the other camera. I'm getting better at this, I think. So these are a, a lure wallet here, and um, they basically go around your rod and your lure to stop them getting caught in everything. So there'll be four of them on your way for you, Aiden. So get your teacher nice. through. They're from Max uh, Wicks. So if you look him up on Facebook, he'll make them to any size you need as well. So is there a, is that a cod pattern on them too? Uh, yeah, it is. Yep. That's cool. Max, Max made uh, Amelia a, a little leather belt. Yeah. He does a very, very good job. Yeah, no. All, uh, all of them were organised uh, by Ricky Doyle through Max, so um, yeah, sweet. Who, uh, do thank Ricky for that. Um, yeah. Alyssa, um, send me that question in a uh, personal message and I'll, I'll have a chat to you about that. It's a bit hard for me to understand your question, so... Um, <laughs> I'll get that answer for you. Mark Cook says another one here. Obviously a big fan of yours, followed you on AFC and knows what you used. Um, how would you compare the Garmin Force to the motor guide um, you used in AFC? Well, I... <laughs> I just got a message from Timmy. Um, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I've, I, I used to have a motor guide on my tinny and my... and. Um, I think I went over when I bought the champion, had a motor guide as well. Um, it has its pros. They, they, they all, every electric has their pros and cons, but I found with the motor guide, their spot lock was really, really good. It was really accurate, um, kept you in place really well. Uh, I never had too many issues with the actual unit. I think uh, I might have had it for about five or six years. Uh, and all I replaced on the actual uh, electric itself was a GPS unit. I had to swap it out. It was easy enough to do. But the one thing I found with the motor guide is, that, is uh, you can attest to this, Captain, is the foot pedals. Um, but we can't blame motor guide for all of your foot pedal problems. No, 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 no. no Some of them did go over the back of the boat. Not, a, not at all. No, I did, I did lose one in <laughs> – I did lose the uh, – the, um, Oh, Mitch, just sorry, I just got distracted then. But that's all right, because you'll have Mitch and Timmy giving you a hard time right they're, now. They're giving me a hard yeah. time right now. Yeah. Basically, I lost one over the side because I didn't have it chained down. Um, but yeah, I did springs and that sort of thing. But overall, I, I really enjoyed using the motor guide unit. I, if, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't have super huge problems. It, it, you know, did the job for me, and I was happy to use it for for years and years. But, um. As far as the Garmin Force goes, uh, I've used it for six to eight months, I guess, and I'm loving it. Yeah, it's it's the the I guess the one thing that I've got to get used to and be careful of is the is the power. Um, one thing that I I've got to be very careful of, especially when I'm guiding, is making sure I don't have it on a hundred and turn it sideways. Because I'll throw someone off the boat. You'll have two boat. customers out of the boat in the water, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't done it yet, but I'm just really, really careful of that. Um, but yeah, as far, as far as spot lock goes, it's a really, it's a really um, a tidy unit. It looks good. Um, doesn't chew a whole lot of power like I thought it would. Um, I, I do think they do look good. I, you know, looking at them over the ghost and over um, the old XI fives and whatnot, they they do look the part, but. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't afford one, so that's that's all good. Um, yeah. But once again, it's what you can afford is, is what you use. I mean, uh, yes. the XI5 is half the price of the others. Um, yep. So um, look at them. Now, I know Timmy's on there annoying the shit out of you on your personal Facebook page. Um, Timmy, uh, I will be ringing you this week. We are going to go live from uh, Wyvernhoe next Saturday night, so we won't be on Monday night next week chewing the fat We'll be on Saturday night and we'll be talking to all as many guys as we can. Timmy's going to be our roving reporter. 
so he'll be out there trying to get interviews with all the different fishermen. Uh, Matty, uh, Mick Johnson and the guys will uh, we will have a, a face-to-face chat on what's been going on on the dam for next mm-hmm. weekend. So we will be live. Tune the Fat will be live on Saturday night, not Monday night next week. Yeah. Um, Bo's got a good question here. Um, so with the screen size, with the live scope, is the bigger the screen, the more detail you see? Um, that's, a, that's a good question, yeah. But I think the simple, simplest way to, to do it, uh, to answer that one is, you know, the GPS map series, I've got an 84 series on mine. It's, it's a high-definition screen, 12-inch, and it's got a really fast processor in it. So basically, yeah, so the bigger the, bigger the, the unit, the, and the better the you know the process and the high definition you're going to get, you're going to be able to see better. Um, it doesn't mean that that's what you know. We've been talking about it all night. It's all about the affordability of things. But get get what you can afford. But I would try and recommend to go, you know, with with the Garmin units, you're paying for what you get. So, you know, you, you're paying for that higher end model. You're going to get a faster processing unit, faster, um, you know high definition but if that's you can't afford that then go go down a few models down go down a few sizes even you're still going to be able to see the same thing it's just going to be on a smaller screen that's as simple as simple as that you know so um yeah go go for what you can afford i know a lot of guys have had a lot of inquiries about it a lot of guys are going to 10 inch um and that's that's the recommendation from a lot of dealers as well but you know if you can afford that bigger screen then go for it Yep, excellent. Another one here. Not sure on uh, how up to price you are. Salty's asks, and that's a pearl of a name, Salty. So um, what a ballpark price set up? I believe from looking today, 199 is the is the live scope transducer setup. Yep. And then you choose your sound, as you said, from then. So you've got the, the EcoMap series, which is a little bit cheaper on the recommended retail price. So yeah. that, what size do they go? They go 7, 9, 10, 12? Uh, something like that, yeah. 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 That, and it's not compatible with the striker units, and that's a question I got earlier with Clarissa. Um, yeah. Calissa, so I'll talk to her about that. So it depends on what you, yeah, your 199, so you're two grand mm-hmm. for, your, for your transducer and your, and your little black box, and mm-hmm. you choose your sounder on that. You, you're sort of looking at um, maybe two grand and above, working up to the you know top of the range, four thousand um, yeah. dollars. And don't, don't be afraid to shop around too, yeah. Yeah, it's not um, it's not like an iPhone where you can only buy it at the same price everywhere in Australia. Um, I know that there's some guys that have, have helped me out immensely. Um, there's guys that have helped you out immensely um, that are that are doing them now. I believe um, Nick from Aberdeen Fishing is um, is a is a stockist now. Uh, Charlton's look after you. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, Char- Charlton's do some good deals for, yep. for a lot yep. of people who ask, yeah. Yep, so, you know, they, they are out there. So that's really good. Thanks for that question, Salty. Um, <laughs> Greg Beatty, g'day, Beats. Um, does Lyscope give you an advantage when somebody cuts in front of you? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> There's obviously a story behind that one, so we'll, we'll flick that one on. Um there's a there was a good team name on the weekend at Family Bass, and I think was there. Yeah, yeah I think they were called the Cutoffs. Yeah. The Cutoffs. Oh, there you go. Um, Adrian Young, another another gentleman that's uh, camped with us before, Maddie. So Adrian's asked, um, how are you finding the perspective mode view? Any tips? Uh, perspective mode view. Oh, I had a conversation with someone about that today. So uh, perspective view is really 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 good but you've got to know what you're looking at like even with the even with the general live scope images that you've played you've really got to know, understand and know what you're looking at know uh you know the distances you know the size of the fish that sort of thing i found it really good at copeton for uh finding lay down timber but i've also found that it's good for shallow water so shallow meaning 10 foot this is where what I found, uh, and everything I'm giving you tonight is my personal opinion or view or whatever. But there's going to be a whole heap of different ones out there. But I find that the 10, 10 foot range up shallower 
is really, really good for the perspective view. Um, as soon as you start sinking out a little bit deep, um, it's a little bit harder to see, and that's where I go to my forward view. Um, but, yeah, that perspective view for finding weed pockets, um, submerged timber, larger fish like Murray cod. Uh, you can see the bass up shallow too, don't get me wrong. You, you can see the bass and, and the yellows and stuff up shallow, but particularly it's going to be a real good one for those, for those you know, cod and barra guys. Yeah. Um, and, and just looking for that structure as well, you know, apart from your side imaging that you can scan over, a perspective view is, is good for looking for it as well. Yeah, so that's uh, basically it flips a transducer horizontally. Is that right? Yeah, so it puts it puts it sideways. You need the perspective bracket for it. Yep. Because you can basically turn your uh, your forward uh, view to it, it moves it around and, and flips it like this, and you're getting a, a horizontal view um, of what's in front. Now I was um, I was out of phone range for four days. My anglers, so I found out, only got Optus phone range. So it was it was pretty hard to keep up with a, a lot of the stuff that was going on. But there was reports, and I haven't got on to check it out yet, but uh, Tony Bennett from Fish Camp Ski uh, put up a, a little bit of a fishing report, and he was talking about a couple of guys went to Mawala last week, caught 30 cod, and they were using the, the Garmin with the um, perspective view. Yeah. Yeah, so, they they smoked. I think they got like seven over a meter. Yeah, they smoked them. So you you imagine that that law, that um, perspective view up in three feet up on those flats would be awesome. Yeah, being able to once again see the fish react, you know, just mm -hmm. unreal. Keep the questions coming in. We've still got some uh, prizes to give away. Let's have a look. Uh, Aiden's home dam is Glenbourne, so drop shotting would work there. Uh, Timmy Steinhouse only does interviews that pay. Um, I'm paying my it? paying my friendship, sir. <laughs> paying your friendship. That that's that's the thing about what we're talking about too tonight is, you know, we're talking about it's cap, you know, the life goes capabilities and stuff, but it's not. <clears throat> there's no. I haven't found a sounder that will catch you fish. It'll help you catch fish, like it'll help you show your fish and whatever else, but it doesn't catch the fish for you. So you, you've just got to be. You will see the desperation on my face in the video I'm putting up on my YouTube tomorrow of a 36-hour <laughs> session finding fish and finding bait schools and big arches around them, and I couldn't get those bastards a bite. It will not. You are true. It will not make you catch fish. Now, yeah. on that, Lake Wyangla, I can tell anyone that lives down this neck of the woods that that is a hidden gem. That place is... You have to go to that place. It is just the guys will hate me for saying this, but get the word out there because it is a hidden gem for big cod. If you're living down here and you're driving to Copeland, you're going straight past Wyangla, you're a fool. <laughs> Dead okay. set fool. Don't go to Blowering. Don't go to Copeland. There's, there was literally only us on the dam and one guy camped way up the back in the, in the state forest. And he was a little guy in a tinny troll. And during the week, there is no one there. It is full of big cod. I scanned a bank, and I think I scanned about 35 cod that I would estimate would have been over 900. Big, yeah. Big cod. And like the skeezy boys, in a comp, in a pressured arm of the dam, they caught five-metre cod and seven cod, you know, when I couldn't even catch fish. Yeah. So, you know, um, it, it's just an amazing place. I will be spending hours upon hours there. It is just, you know, it's my new favourite dam. I'll still do my annual trip to Copeland to catch up with Billy and the boys, but I'm going to be doing a lot more at Wangler. It is a, it is a dead set hidden gem. How, how, how far is it from you for a drive? Two and a half. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, well... Two hours and forty five with a with a piss stop. So uh, <laughs> and and um it's two hours to to um blowering. So, you know, it's much of a much and but Wyangler has, has very similar when I got there and on prefish day I thought, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll tap the memory banks for coped and that bank looks very much like um that bay in coped and that that you know, there was a lot of 
of similarities to Cope and big boulders, lay downs, all that sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah. why angler, don't uh, don't write it off. And I know the guys, um, you know, a new bunch of guys. I met a whole new bunch of guys with the AYC. It was great to catch up with a few guys. Got to talk with as many as I could. It was a shitty weekend. It rained. Um, there were scores of wind. And with the 36-hour session, um, guys are out on the water all night. So you don't get to talk to everyone. Um, but it was good to, to meet some new guys, and they, they were telling me stories of Burrandong and Burrandjuk and and whatnot. And you know, I've already been to Windermere. I know it's it's yellow heaven. So, uh, mm-hmm. okay, the questions coming in. We've got one, another one from Mark. Um, he said, "Has uh, Livescope improved your guiding, putting clients onto active fish?" Um, it's definitely it's definitely helped find active fish. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess they're good. It's a good question, that one, because the simple answer is yes, yeah. So it's it's really good to see clients become more interactive with the technology. Um, they can, like I was saying before, they can see the fish actively swimming on the screen. They can, uh, the, the guys at Copeton the other day, 90% of the cast, you could see the lure sink to the bottom and they knew exactly where that lure was working along the contour of the bottom. Um, so you know that you, you're fishing right. You know that the, your clients can, can see that the fish are, are there and they're active. Um, but, yeah, like I said before, you, you, can, you still have days where you don't get a lot of fish because the, the, the live scope will show you the fish, but it won't, they, you won't make a meat, you know. So... Um, yeah, but it's, it's just a, a really cool interactive way to, to fish now because everything's live. Um, yeah, so um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, the simple answer is, yeah, it's, it's, it's great for the clients. It's, it's good for me to be able to explain it to. And even when I was running my old units um, and only having the down scan, I was still, you know, it all comes down to time on the water and, and knowing what the fish are doing. And you could see even on your, uh, your traditional sonar, you could still see when those fish were becoming active and, and they were rising off the bottom and the way they were moving through the water column. You could see and understand that they were, they were getting hungry and, and how they were going to react to your lures. But even with the live scope, I had to kind of relearn that a little bit because... Uh, what I thought, what I had processed in my mind that was happening, is totally different to what's actually happening. So yeah, that's um, a that's a great point. I, I mm. once I started putting the camera on the boat, and, and actually, you know, with the uh, Garmin verbs I've been using for a few years now, on a, a one twenty eight gig card at seven twenty p, I can record nine hours of non stop footage. Yeah, what it has actually taught me is that I'm not doing what I thought I was doing. Okay. When I'm catching the fish, I'll, I'll be casting out and thinking I'll, I'm really slow rolling it. And when I caught that fish, and I'll be swear to God that I slow rolled it. When I watched the video back, I wasn't actually slow rolling, or I didn't pause when I thought I'd paused. And yeah. you actually sit the camera there and just watch yourself fish. You, you sometimes you're not actually doing what you think you're doing. Yeah. It's been amazing. Uh, Max Wicks said thanks for the thanks for the shout out. Jeff Barry, I'll put this one up for my son. Um, Corey should have taken Harry with you. He would have showed you how to catch cod. Well, he <laughs> did that. He's a member of the Meter Club as an eleven year old, a Meter fourteen. So uh, uh, he's got his little fan club on this show. They all love to uh, hang it on me and and uh, give him. Uh, Jeff has actually uh, won a prize last week and sent. Um, Send a photo through, so I've still got to share that with um, Harry. Uh, Calissa's got another question here. Matt, have you ever had your clients tell you to turn off the sounders and fish old school? Um, never, never had them tell me to. No, but we um, even even with guiding and that sort of thing, um, I still do a lot of old school stuff. So you know, you you still go up and you know fish in areas that that you don't really need your sounder in and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, some of the, some of the techniques and some of the areas we get ourselves into, you don't, you don't necessarily need your sounder. So, yeah. um, yeah, I guess that's, that's a, yeah, I, I've never actually had anyone say, can you turn it off? But uh, 
the, the good thing is with a lot of clients, they do ask a lot of questions and they, they, they ask questions exactly like that. They, they say, um, have you ever just thought of turning your sounders off and will the fish bite if you do that? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, the more, the more that I fish, the more that I see that, you know, it's more – a lot of it's environmental, but there is elements of, of knowing that fish do know you're there sometimes. So. I need to say, like, uh, you know, as much as I like to, to promote – products that I believe in and so on and so forth. It's still not going to catch you the fish. You've still got to catch the fish. Yeah. You traditionally, when I first met you, Maddie, you were the, you were a gut fisherman. You went with your gut, um, you know, and you still do. I'm not saying that you don't, but it was all about, you know, the feeling. And you've always said that the people from the country and people that hunt uh, – make better fishermen because they can read the environment, they can read the change, they can, they can feel the, the cool breeze, they can see the moon, phase, whatever it is. So, uh, you know, it's still not going to catch you the fish, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's funny you say that. I was just having this conversation on the weekend. Um, Timmy. Uh, the conversation, exactly that, Captain, was um, those guys that, that – and I'm not saying this is this goes for all the it's not city versus country or whatever else, but I think it's the people that have been exposed to the outdoors. Um, and you know, like I grew up hunting feral pigs and and um, culling roos and and you know dingoes, dingo trapping and um, watching the different cycles of different animals. It's exactly the same with fish, except the fish you can't see because they're under the water. So instead of my eyes being able to see a dingo track or where a pig's been working or whatever else, with fishing, we've got to rely on technology. So uh, the more that, exactly what you just said, the more that I've grown to use technology, I feel more confident now. Whereas in the past, yeah, it was, it was all about, you know, noticing wind changes and cloud cover and sunny days and, you know, wind blowing on a particular bank and, um now it's that plus your technology and you piece you put that together you, you can really get a, a good formula happening yeah and there's a few guys out there that uh that have done that and you're one of them that is able to to still think old school and still use the technology to its maximum and mold them together uh yeah. most of us will will get carried away with one or the other and, you know, forget to mould them together. I, I know that you're definitely good at that. We've um, got another question here. Um, uh, Jeff Harry's just sent me a message. He said he likes you and your comment. So um, how user-friendly do you find the Lioscope and Garmin unit? Is there much fine-tuning involved? Not, a, not at all, no. I, I found um, with, with most units on any brand nowadays, uh, it's – a lot of it is plug and play. You, 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 you know, connect it to power, you connect your transducer and you're ready to go. Um, certain situations and water depths and, and different dams, you might have some little bits of fine tuning, but even your fine tuning um, now with these, especially the Garmin units, is very easy to do. Um, every time they release a new series of sounders or they release... Um, you know, a, a, 2000 and, a 2020 model or a 21 model, they become more user-friendly so that basically more people can use them because that's what ultimately that's what they want. They want more people using their products. So they're going to make them more easy to use, um, more user-friendly, um, easier to read, easier to see. Um, but most units nowadays, like I said, you just plug them in and they're ready to go. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Uh, here's another great one, Nick. Again, uh, what size and type batteries are you using for your live scope? Uh, and roughly how much runtime are you getting out of your batteries? Uh, I know you changed over to lithiums. Mix it up with uh, with the lithiums. Yeah, so I've got I've got two Invicta lithiums. So basically, um, yeah, so I'm running the the. Tw what is it? Hundred? I think it's a equivalent to one hundred and twenty amp hours or something, or it might be one hundred and thirty. But with with my crank battery, um, it's a wireless it's a wireless setup. So basically, I can check my 
charge on that one just with my mobile phone through an app. Uh, the other one, it's a little bit a little bit older, um, but what I've worked out with it, the more that I've used it, um, I can get two full days, so two full eight-hour sessions running uh, three 12-inch uh, GPS map series and a seven-inch, so four sounders, and I can get 16 hours out of it. Um, I would, I haven't tried the third day because I'm not willing to risk it, you know, like, so I've done, yeah, two full eight hour days running four units nonstop. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I've found with the, with the that's 12. That's without charge, isn't it? That's without charge, yeah. yeah. So, you, you know, if you're going away, you forget your, your generator, you don't have a powered site, you can go away for a full weekend, uh, Saturday, Sunday, and do two full days without charging. And for the average Joe that isn't fishing tournament, there's no way he's, he's generally going to be out there for eight hours Saturday and Sunday because that cuts into your drinking time. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. All right. Go for a morning. Hour, yeah. So. That was the hardest thing I found with the, with the AYC on the weekend, the 36-hour session. There was no – and as I said, on the video you'll see it uh, – there was no need – I did. It was raining, so I just didn't want to get out of bed. So I didn't. I didn't. I didn't have to go to the start line and start with everyone else and and get my key tag. You get it at the start of the weekend, you drop it back at the end of the weekend. So uh, it was raining. I just nah, stuff it. I'm staying in bed. I'm I'm happy to have a donut. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Dude. <laughs> so it cuts into your personal time. <laughs> Man, thirty. Would you say thirty six hours? Yeah, thirty six hour session. Yeah. Was there guys that fished the full 36? I, I don't think so. Um, I, there was guys that went out because the briefing finished at 8 o'clock and then you could start. Um, yeah. There was guys that went straight out and fished all night and then come back for a few hours sleep and then fished all the next night. But it was it was terrible weather. The winds, wind blew through and it chopped up and um, the rain come through. You know, there was that much rain in my boat on Sunday morning that when I pulled the bung out, I think I'd um, nearly flooded the next door neighbour's camp. So, <laughs> um, yeah, my, the guys that went, as I said, the guys that went out there. But it was funny. Another thing I learnt from the weekend: the bite time was between ten and eleven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I was already home eating bacon and eggs. Um, yeah. You know, I did me the three or four a.m. start, and I was home by sort of seven, eight o'clock. And they were getting their bite time. They'd stayed out longer. They worked harder, and they um, they got the rewards. You got the yeah, yeah. It's, you just don't know sometimes. Uh, what's your funniest moment while guiding? Oh, funniest moment while guiding. Um, I don't know. There, there's been a lot of funny moments. I, I get it. The the people that I have uh, on you know on the boat with us are a lot of the time are really like-minded people so i basically there's no one i've never got along with so there's always good moments throughout the day there's been a few times there's been some memorable moments um Rido, a fella that comes he's been out with me a few times he got a he got two bass on one lure one day that was that was pretty funny um but actually those two boys uh chris parker and Rido, uh they've come with me a few times they have like a little competition between themselves so i like when you know you get a couple of people on the boat that are that are challenging each other um but also you know asking the questions and that's throughout the day so um yes it's 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 just moments like that it's it's, um you know guys like that are out to have a bit of fun and a bit of banter between mates and, and include you in it that's that's real good fun but um yeah, there's there's been there's been tons of moments, but I, I just can't think of the funniest one off the top of my head. But all right, well, this will lead into the next question. What um, Timmy Steinhouse has written? What's your worst experience with the boating partner? <laughs> the worst and the best, all in one weekend. How about that? Yeah, give it, give us that one. Tell us that story. So the worst weekend, uh, and this is actually with you, George Truly. So it was a. At Bioki Peters Dam, we had a Bass Nation teams tournament on. And for some reason, we went out, I think it was the pre-fish. I, can't, I think it was the pre-fish. Corey, who I was fishing with, was just cro- was so sick he couldn't even stand up. And I had I had the fish fairly well 
old tune, but this particular day they weren't cooperating and we were finding a little bit hard. So uh, the times that Corey did stand up, um, he did – what did you tie on? You tied, he tied a skirted jig on with a – Beetle spin. With a be- <laughs> beetle spin, threw it twice and got whacked on the second cast. And I said – Oh, are you joking? And then it, all of a sudden it just dawned on me that they needed something thumping and flashy. So we were fishing plastics um, out in the deep water drop-offs and, and you know, out, out on the flats and that sort of thing. And that luck, Corey just found, that was like my worst experience fishing with him because he was spewing and, and that sort of thing and getting up every now and again. But then the best part of it was that you found actually the, the little catalyst that we needed to get the win so we went out on the sunday when the comp was on and we put a little beetle spin on our plastics and just wailed them and And it was it was the tiniest of beetle spins too like you know yeah real like proper tiny but i think we won by nearly two kilos or something that was uh bad greggy's fault i I will uh greggy mitchell and mick johnson won last night cap that night um i can remember having three beers and we said we'll have one night cap before we go to bed you went to bed and um we ended up polishing off uh, about three bottles of scotch each and uh and the next morning, all my leaders were bloody yep, burnt off. Yeah, Greggy burnt all your leaders off, and you backed into the gate. And oh. we we had an absolute – I had to get up and cook, uh, what was it, 30 breakfasts for the guys in the morning, and I made Greggy get out of bed and come and help me. And we ended up winning that comp by, like, um, you know, we might as well have handed in half a bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember I was so cranky that morning. But it you were going to kick me out of the boat on pre-fish day. You said, if I, you ever do this to me again, we're never fishing together. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's – that's one worst experience I have. I did have another pretty – when I was a co-boater, and we, I'm not going to mention names, but I, I had a, an experience down south one time with a, with a pro, and I, I, I just don't think that this guy was on the same planet as what, what the – I don't think he knew what he was doing. Um, I, don't, I won't say – I don't think he was on anything, but, yeah, it was just a really <laughs> awkward, strange day on the water we didn't catch anything and it was very very strange so um that was quite a long time ago that was probably five or six years ago but it's very different things like that you remember you do you do um let's get uh to get the final questions we'll have to call it quits matty's gonna have to go to bed he's yeah. um he's got some stuff to do um get your final questions in at the moment i'm just going through to see if i can find any other questions <laughs> that i might have missed <laughs> Don't don't be afraid to ask any any it doesn't you know it can be the most simplest question or tricky whatever I'm happy to offer advice. I'm um, Jeremy. Jeremy, here we go. Um, I did see this one before. What would be your best tip for fishing Copeton? What say that again? What would be your best tip for fishing Copeton? Uh, the best tip: stick to your bite time. So stick to your. And I know a lot of guys do this, but stick to those low light periods. You're always going to get a bite time either early or late. Um, And it's been different every time that I've gone there. This particular time, um, the bite time was 6.30 in the morning. Um, We've been there, you know, three or four years ago and... The bite time's been in the afternoon, and then we've I've had times there with Chris George uh, years ago where they wouldn't bite in the morning, but right through dark, uh, as soon as it got dark, they bit from dark right through until midnight until the moon came up. Um, so, yeah, just just I think it pays with Copeton to put the time in. Um, don't just go there for a day and expect to catch something. Go there for a few days, really work out when that bite time is and try and fish fish your way around that. Yeah, I think we're on uh, – this year was the first year in six years we haven't gone for an annual week. So we normally go down for seven days. And I can tell you it always takes us um, about three days to even start to work them out. Yeah. If you're going to drive all that way, make sure that you're going down there for a few days so you can at least 
worked. I don't know how many stories I've I've heard of people. Oh, I went to Copeland for three days and we caught them on the last day. I'm like, yeah. you've just worked it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one from Aiden. What rods uh, do you recommend to have as a non boater for ABT? Um, so, what rods would you recommend to have as a non boater for ABT? Um, I definitely. It, it all depends on who you're fishing with, but just just to play it safe, I'd have at least one bait. I'd have three rods, so I'd have one bait caster. Um, so you're fishing for accuracy. If those guys are fishing edges or fishing trees or rock walls or something, just just have a bait caster for fishing accuracy. Um, have a light spin rod, so I'd have a seven foot spin rod. Uh, so go, going back to the bait caster six foot um bait caster with a you know standard ratio reel five three to one or something like that uh, is a good bait caster setup spin rod have a lighter uh two to four kilo setup with a thousand size reel um line size 10 pound braid 10 pound leader just for that's generally just for fishing open water you can fish a half ounce jig head 20 gram spoon hop a blade whatever, you can fish with that lighter setup and have a heavier setup as well. So a, a spin rod that's, you know, four to three to six kilo, four to eight kilo, something like that. Just something a bit heavier with a fast taper, just in case you, you're fishing something heavier like a big spinner bait, um, a mass vibe, uh, big crank baits like that. You can throw that on a heavier spin rod. Uh, and I'd go with two and a half thousand size reel. Um, just so you you can get that line on the reel quicker, you, you know you can fish timber with it, you can fish rock walls, you can fish open open flats, but it's just something with a bit more go about it to get that lure in quicker or that fishing quicker and a and a heavier line too. So go twelve pound and fourteen pound leader or something like that. They're the three setups I'd have. Yeah, and look, uh, Aiden. As I say each week on the show, just buy the best you can possibly afford at the time. Yep. You don't have to go out and buy thousand dollar rods and reels to start yep. off with. Buy what you can afford. Get the best of what you can afford, and then yep. uh, then enjoy your fishing. And you can slowly upgrade from there. You can you can get a better view. I jumped in and use whatever rods I had for, for ages and then upgraded from there. So, um, you know, that's what I suggest to people as well. Yeah. I, I remember one of, the, one of my first rods I bought was a Berkeley drop shot and I bought it from a, what do you call those shots? A pawn shop? The, yep. Pawn shop. Yep. Second yep. hand shop. Second hand shop. I think it was like 25 bucks. And then I went and bought at another pawn shop. I bought a reel. That was, I think I paid 35 bucks for it. And I've still got that rod in my shed now. Yep. And, I, and I've used it. I've used it for 10 years, I reckon, and it still catches fish. And it was worth nothing, but it caught fish, and that's all you need. You just need something that you can cast with and catch fish with. And get out there and enjoy it. Most of, most of the time, and especially as a co, you're there to learn. It's not yeah. about winning. It's about yeah. learning. You, yeah. You're getting all that experience and all that different gear and different people. And with the with shared weight of ABTs, people share information. And, you know, as Timmy Steinhouse said a couple of weeks ago, as one of the um, long-term co-boaters of the industry where, you know, people will even hand him a rod or, or whatever if he hasn't got the right equipment there. So don't stress about it too much. The guys are really good. The attitudes have changed. No longer have you got the the old school, um, you know, my way or the highway. Get there, talk to people, you'll learn a heap. Yeah, exactly. We're going to give away one more prize, Matty. Who should we give it to? Uh couple of questions there. I'm just uh, thinking we gave uh, – so the postcode went to Brian Yana. Uh, winner of the first prize was Aiden, who's asked a couple of pearl of questions tonight. I was going to say you should give it to him, but he's, he's already won one. He's uh, yeah. asking a good question. Brody. Jeremy won one last week. Yeah, Timmy, that, that's a, that is a great point. Check the discount racks at your tackle store. Yeah. I can tell you that um, if you're in Albury or Wodonga at the moment and going to BCF, you'll get a heap of great bass gear 
uh, for next to nothing because they're, they're cleaning out their shelves at the moment. I actually went in there last week to um, – it was the Wodonga BCF to, to grab something and they had a, a three-in-one transducer for a Lowrance Reckon the retail price about two hundred and fifty dollars. They had it in there on the discount bin for thirty bucks. You know that had the metal bracket one, everything else. So it was straight in the pocket. I just use it for that second metal bracket and um, use it as a spare later on. I just couldn't resist. It's true though. And the other piece of advice: um, don't buy, don't get on the internet and buy cheap stuff off eBay or. Don't go for the two cent bargain, you know. Go, go and physically, like you, like Timmy said, like what you just said. Just have a look at the, you know, the the discounts. Um, you know, they might have sales on or whatever. But don't, whatever you do, don't buy online because you're not physically seeing the product. I bought. I mean, in, in the early days, I learned a lot from experience just by buying cheaper stuff on the internet, and some of it does, doesn't even swim. You know, it's just it looks yeah. like a lure but doesn't act like a lure, you know. Yeah. So. And not only that, you you try if you try and support your local um tackle shop in any which way, shape you can, mm -hmm. because if you don't and they have to close their doors, then you have to just, you know, buy everything online. Support your local tackle shop. We we did the whole COVID run earlier in the in the early, uh, just support local. So if you've got the opportunity and it's only a couple of bucks different, don't buy off eBay. Go to your local shop and support them because they'll give you the information. They'll give you the truth. They'll give you the, you know, the warranty and everything else that you need with it. So yeah, I've selected the second winner, um, Salty. So oh, yeah. um, nice. Salty asked the question earlier on in the night, so I'm going to give him the prize. So Salty, um, can you send me through to my Facebook page your details and I will send you the uh, next prize and I haven't even worked out what it is yet. So um, I might um, might ask you where you're fishing, whether whether we send you a um, maybe a, a spoon or um, something like that. So we'll work that out. So... Mm -hmm. Last couple of minutes, get your questions in just quickly. Uh, we've got one last one here from Shane Eastman. So um, does the Ecomap UHD 95 SV, now that's a mouthful, have a good <laughs> enough screen clarity for live scope? The, the Ecomap series should do. Um, the UHD, yeah, should be right. The, the only one that I, I, I'm really familiar with, the GPS map series, um, that's the ones that I use because, that you know, that's what i got on my boat, so I need to know about them. But um, as far as I know, the Eco Map series um, should be fine. Um, the, the only one that I know that doesn't or isn't, as far as I'm aware, isn't capable is the, the Strikers, and the Strikers are a very simple, very cheap unit. So I don't, I don't see a reason why it shouldn't have... Clarity, like the U, the EcoMap UHD, uh, UHD stand, stands for ultra high definition. So, does the nine stand for the size of the screen? Is that a nine inch screen? I think so. Yeah, I think, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, pretty sure. So, um, yeah. But if you if you if you got any questions um, or anything like that, with as you know with Garmin products, go onto their website. Um, there's a Garmin Australia website. It's got basically all their products. Um, look on Marine. Um, there is uh, some on chart plotters as well. But, um, yeah, do your research. Have a bit of a look through. Try and find your local uh, Garmin dealer. Like I said, the, the guys that I regularly send people to uh, is Charlton's. Um, you know, anyone who deals in Garmin, contact them, ask them about it. Um, even send me a message, I'll, I'll, I'll happily help. But do your research and just try and find out exactly what you need. And, um, and yeah, there be heaps of people out there to, to, to help you out. But just don't rush into anything. Just make sure you do your research and, and study up. Yep, excellent. I think that's it for the questions. They're all uh, easing up. We've been on for ages. 
Matty, yeah. thanks again for your time tonight. We will be talking to you hopefully again next week. Don't forget, everyone, that next week we are going to try and go live from Wyvernho ABT. So we will be on at some stage, preferably Saturday night, and we'll yeah. try and chew the fat hard with a few of the guys and get um, some information on where they're catching the fish and whatnot. It's unfortunate. Uh, Queensland borders closed and I can't get there, but good luck to all of you. Good luck to you, Matty. Um, good luck to everyone that's fishing the, the ABT. It looks like pretty much because of COVID, I won't be qualifying for the grand final with only three comps and missing one. It's probably mm. not going to happen. So um, okay. I'll, I hope to get up to Somerset uh, next month. Um, you know, I have got family up there, so I was using it as a, as a dual purpose trip. But uh, that's the way it goes. For everyone in Victoria that's in lockdown, stay safe, be good, follow the rules and... We will get through this. I'm thinking about all of you guys down there that are in full lockdown. I know that uh, there is going to be some way, shape or form. Victoria is going to go into lockdown fully. So um, we'll mm. be there with you. And uh, this show will continue because that's why we set it up is because of the lockdown. So uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Um, good luck, Matty. Um, yeah, just uh, watch for my video that I'm dropping tomorrow on my YouTube. Uh, it's pretty... Um, disheartening so <laughs> we'll leave it at that all right guys out for now see you later catch up